Welcome to In Her Voice. My name is Kelly Covert, and I am passionate about helping women live authentically by listening to their inner voice. Get ready to be inspired by women of all walks of life that have set aside their should be's and not good enough's and are standing in their true voice, the voice of wisdom that each and every one of us has inside. listening to In Her Voice, I am so thankful for you. Thankful that you decided to press play, that you decided to bring me and my amazing guest into your life for the next 45 minutes or so. And so just, just thank you. I really appreciate you. I have a super cool guest today. Her name is Allie Boone. And gosh, she's so Dang, interesting. You guys are going to really just um, love this interview a lot. We talk about so many different things. We talk about learning who you actually are. We talk about creating an impact. We talk about how to move from the analytical part of your brain to the creative and soulful part of your brain. And we also talk, of course, about listening to your inner voice. Let me read you her bio because it's going to give you an insight into who Allie is. Allie Boone left her corporate nine to five job as an aeronautical engineer to create lifestyle design and start her own business. Now she goes to school for fun, travels and flies airplanes. How does she do this? Allie has found the great way to generate truly passive income by investing in turnkey rentals. And through her company, Hipster Investments, she also teaches others to do the same. And by the way, we're not talking about real estate (laughs) today, we're talking about the courage it takes to discover who you are, to go against what you thought you've always been and what you thought you've always supposed to be into who you really are, into finding your soul. And that's why I love this interview so much. It's unusual. Allie is super cool. You're going to love hearing her voice and feeling her energy. And so let's get right to our interview with Allie Boone. Allie Boone, welcome to In Her Voice. It's so glad to have you here today. Oh, thanks for having me, Kelly. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So you just have this most amazing, fascinating story to me. Um, You've done so many things already in your life. And so I thought that we would really start there because I'm featuring you as one of my visionary women. And (laughs) what I love to do with visionary women is to just dig into the story so we can understand better how to become visionary women ourselves. Cool. I love that because I've I've always had, well, speaking of visions, I've always had a vision of my story helping people. So that if, if that can ever happen, I'm all for it. Yeah. Well, I'm sure it will today. I have a good feeling. <laughs> <laughs> I like good feelings. Yeah. So, you know, so what you, you know, from what I know from reading, you started out like leaving college with an aerospace engineering degree, Mm -hmm. and that's very far from what you're doing now. (laughs) So why don't you just kind of give us an overview of, of your story of how you came to be doing what you're doing now? Yeah, totally. And since you mentioned the degree of aerospace engineering, it's funny because since then I've gotten a master's degree in spiritual psychology. So if that act, if that is the best <laughs> overview of how opposite direction I ended yeah. up going. Um, yeah, so my story is, you know, I really grew up the um, I, I kind of the famous story, I guess, get good grades, go to school, get a secure job, yada, yada, yada. And um, I was very epically left brained, like math was my thing. And it was more of a you know, like the, the famous story of, you know, don't have feelings. Those are stupid and go be good at math. And that's all that matters. And so that's what I did. And I was flying airplanes while I was in school for aerospace engineering. So all the more linear left brain nonsense. And, um, so I got into that industry and the very first day that I walked in, I walked into this cubicle and I looked down at what I was wearing. I was wearing these business casual clothes and I, this cubicle, I had, my office had been the sky before that. It was this great, gray draft. I just, it was like my soul just left me through my toes. I was like, oh no, <laughs> like this is what I've worked so hard to get to. And 
So from day one, I wanted out and I spent about five years just exploring, like, how do I get out of my corporate job? And I had no idea where that was going to take me. I just, you know, it was kind of a journey in itself. And then, uh, I ended up starting my real estate investing company almost kind of unexpectedly, and I'm sure we'll kind of talk more about that, but it happened very, um, you know, people ask how I got in real estate, and I'm like, well, it kind of found me. Like, it was very much this journey of trying the hardest that I could, but also being open to what presented itself to me. So my company that I have now, it's, um, you know, it's not that I didn't work for it at all because I worked hard for five years just trying anything, but it really, I couldn't have created the company to what it is now it um you know there was a lot of lessons in that and just a very different mindset change for me becoming an entrepreneur because unlike engineering and flying airplanes i realized that i couldn't some i couldn't just make something happen and that was what i was used to that's what i was trained to do is make things happen and so it was this very um uh very kind of soulful journey in learning about more of who I am, actually am, because I was kind of under some false impressions on that one. And then, you know, amidst becoming an the entrepreneur, then I started working on the spiritual psychology degree. And, you know, it really, um, I, I'm just, I, in some ways I'm not different at all today, but in other ways I'm completely different. Like I always think my friends from 20 years ago wouldn't even know, of course I'm from Georgia. So when they know I moved to LA and they're like, oh boy, they're, you know, <laughs> we lost another one. <laughs> another one bites the dust. <laughs> another one bites the dust. She's, she's gone. She's floated off. We're now getting her back. Um, yeah, it's just been this really cool journey. And now uh, I run my company. I do, I'm kind of a mutt. I do all sorts of different things. Um, but it's really for me, it's about the lifestyle design and really coming to know who I am and what I'm supposed to be doing, what I'm here for, and really just enjoying life. And that's the thing is just, you know, minute by minute, like if you're not enjoying what you're doing, what are we here for type of thing. So I really, I love talking about that kind of stuff, passive income, lifestyle design, finding yourself. And yeah, it's just, it's just a constant journey for me because I find something out new about myself every day. It's kind of exhausting, honestly. Yeah. And exciting, <laughs> right? And exciting all at the same time. Yeah. Well, and I think that's what I love so much about your story is just this sort of openness to discovering something new about yeah. you. Like I think so often we get stuck in this is who I am, this is who I've always been. And mm -hmm. it becomes really scary to step out in a new and different way. Yeah, and in our defenses of that too, you know, a lot of times we have resistance, like there could be some reason that we're terrified to suddenly not be the thing that we're, we think we're supposed to be. And I get that, like it's part of the human experience. But yeah, it's really, it's, I would say, I, I think someone asked me a couple of years ago, like what my, uh, favorite trait about myself was, and it was open-mindedness because I always like to say I'm the most gullible person in a room. If you tell me there's a way to be really freakishly happy, I'm in, <laughs> like <laughs> I believe it. And you know, sometimes the gullible thing does not work in my favor, but in this case, the open-mindedness, like I'm all ears. Like, Hey, if you want to tell me something that's going to make my life more enjoyable, bring it on. Like I, mm -hmm. I love that. And I think it, the open-mindedness really is kind of the, um, I think it's, it's kind of what gets you there. Like it's what can bring the most success and success being, you know, whatever you want it to be, not just professionally. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to, I want to go back to maybe even before you went to college, mm -hmm. you said that you were just were like totally left brained, you know, like that you didn't even really recognize that you had feelings. I didn't. And I mean, how did how did that how did you start to break out of that? I mean, was it that moment that you walked into that corporate office or were there hints of it before then that there's more there's more to life than what I've been experiencing? I think there were there were definitely hints of it. Uh, there was certainly feedback about it, especially in my dating relationships. You know, I'd date someone and <laughs> I'd, I would get feedback fairly regularly about me not being in touch with feelings. I'm like, what are you talking about? I didn't <laughs> like I didn't know. And so it actually was um, a significant relationship that kind of kickstarted this because this relationship ended and it was it was the total heartbreak. It was like the first love heartbreak, you know, just disaster. And for someone who didn't have feelings to suddenly experience this much in the feelings department was a little overwhelming. Um, and my reflection on that relationship is that I was absolutely in love, but in the moment, I didn't know how to be in love. I didn't know how to experience that. It was there. I had that knot in my stomach and all that fun stuff. But 
during the time the relationship was going on, I didn't know. I just, I had no concept whatsoever of how to be in that. And so with that being my reflection, I was like, well, geez, you know, first of all, I am a girl. Like that, that was my, because I was really, I was raised to be a guy, really. I mean, it was, I was always in male dominated industries. I was told, you know, shove your feelings down. They're terrible. Um, you know, I really relate to men a lot in that. And well, let's, I, mm-hmm. I want to dig into that a little bit. I mean, do yeah. you have brothers or is this, you know, was this dri- driven through your head by, by your parents? Or I mean, like, what was, what was yeah. going on there? I think it was, I hope my mom never listens to this. She's like, <laughs> you're talking about this. Um, I'll make sure not to tell her about this one. Okay. Um, she, so it was, it was definitely my parents and I think it was more in my mom. And my mom's story was that she grew up in the worst of the worst, like the abusive, alcoholic, poverty, you name it. That's, that was her world growing up. And she was very fortunate and she got herself out of that. Like she really has no remnants of that at all. Her and my dad are, they've been married 46 years now, you know, just they've, they're fine with money. They're all that kind of stuff. But in order for my impression of it, at least her and I haven't talked about this, but my impression is that in order for her to survive that world, she had to start thinking and stop with the feelings because the Mm -hmm. feelings were too much. And so I think, and she's, I mean, truly one of the best, I mean, I really won the ovarian lottery. Like my parents are fantastic, but I think in my mom's mind in, or, you know, she wanted to keep me out of what she experienced. And because thinking was her survival, she trained me to be a thinker. And so Mm -hmm. it was, you know, and she had best of intentions and everything and we're all here to learn something. And I think mine was more feelings based. Uh, But yeah, it definitely came from the parents and it actually wasn't until even recent years that I realized how much I understand men. Cause I actually thought I didn't understand them at all. And I more recently, one of my biggest things now is I volunteer in prisons and I thought I was going to just be kind of annoyed or whatever in the men's prison. But for the first time, it's like I found my people because I hear their stories and I'm like, Oh my gosh, I was raised like that too. And you know, I, I, I understand men a lot more than I realized. And so, yeah, it was really that, you know, and of course the gender roles, it, they are what they are, but men typically are raised, you know, don't cry or I'll, I'll knock the feelings out of you or, you know, whatever the story is. So yeah, I, I really resonated with them, but in the moment of this relationship ending, I was like, wait, I'm a girl. (laughs) Like, I'm pretty sure I should explore what this emotion feeling thing is that everyone keeps talking about. And it was such a mystery and it was actually really frustrating for a while because I was even asking people like, okay, I need to understand emotions and feelings. Like, can you explain them to me? And I was hoping for like a bulletized spreadsheet list that could explain <laughs> like, a like graph. yeah, I am great with bar graphs, pie, like I, whatever you can do up an Excel spreadsheet, I'm all for it. And people would just stare at me and I'm, I'm like, seriously, how, how do you understand a feeling when you can't? always you can't really put words to it as much and I so for the longest time I was just clueless but I was like I gotta figure this thing out and eventually I don't remember how much I mean this is that relationship ended 10 years ago so that let's see 10 a little over 10 years ago so this has been at least a decade long journey and it at least wasn't until probably year five or so that I remember finally feeling, it's not that I never had emotions, but I just had no connection with them. Like you couldn't name, it's almost like you couldn't name them. Yeah. Well, in the beginning too, it was almost that I couldn't feel them. Like I, things would happen. Like I could be frustrated, but I wouldn't, I was so in my head that I, it overrode any actual feeling. Like I, I know my body was experiencing them, but I didn't. I, I just had nothing. I had no, if it wasn't in a math equation, I didn't understand what was happening. And, wow. but later on, um, I was able to kind of, it was so frustrating. Nobody could explain these things in a spreadsheet. <laughs> I haven't even thought about that, but I was really frustrated. And it's like, how do I learn what this is if no one can tell it to me? And so I just kept trying and trying. And finally, once I started feeling those things, I was like, oh, no wonder they couldn't explain them in a spreadsheet. Now I get it. So it's really, um, you know, I, I watch, um, I don't know if you've seen the show Atypical on Netflix about the autistic oh, teenager. It. Yes. Oh, it's like my favorite show. But watching him, I'm like, I get it. Like when they had the flashcards with the, um, uh-huh. to explain emotions, like someone who's happy might look like this. <laughs> I was like, why didn't I have those flashcards when I was trying this? Um, 
but yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's feelings are funny. They still yeah. kind of get me something like, Ugh, I, mm. well, and you know, I think what's so interesting about feelings versus thoughts. Yeah. And, and because for me, I would say I'm probably on the other end of the spectrum, you know, like I am so feeling and, mm-hmm. um, and sometimes I need to be a little bit more like thoughtful yeah. about, about things. And I think probably most people would find themselves somewhere on that spectrum. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so I think just what's so interesting is that it's not about one versus the other mm-hmm. as about using them both in a balanced sort of way, you know, exactly. like allowing yourself to feel the feelings um, once you know what they are, a lot of people don't want to feel it. So they right. stuff it down or they numb themselves out with food or alcohol or whatever. Mm-hmm. But also having the awareness to be able to say, oh, here's the feeling. Why am I feeling this? Yeah. What can I do about that? You know, what what is this trying to tell me? Yeah. Um, and going to like that next step of of in your case, you could say it's almost like solving the equation. You feel yeah. the feeling and then you go, you find the solution to that. Mm-hmm. And I think it's really interesting to hear you talk about coming at it from the other direction. Yeah. And you know, one, one question that I have for you is how did you get out of your head? Like, do you have any practices? <laughs> I'll let you or... know when that happens. <laughs> 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 that is a... Uh... That, you know, it really, it's an everyday challenge for me. Like, I now am so much less heady than I was before. Like, now I, you know, it was actually kind of funny because when I started tapping into these feelings things, I actually kind of shot, I felt like I shot over to the other end of the spectrum, the one you're talking about. And I remember having some uh, bout of feelings or something. And I, <laughs> I thought I was like, Oh my God, if I'm on the feelings end of the spectrum now, am I not gonna be able to do math anymore? Like, it <laughs> but for a little while it felt like I had lost the math side. I'm like, Oh, I guess I'll have to get that back later. But you know, then I kind of came back to the balance, but now it's, I, if I were to, well, here's my engineer brain kicking in. I would almost say like, I'm probably 80% there where, you know, my head is, it's hard some and honestly it's hard sometimes because I don't always know which of my voices is speaking. Is it the feeling mm. speaking? Is it my head speaking? Is it someone random so you know I I sometimes I feel kind of schizophrenic like okay, who's talking? I, you know, I want to make sure I follow the feelings and all that kind of stuff, but um getting out of my head is that's a tough one. That's also one I can't really put in a spreadsheet. It's really just practice. Um you know, and you were talking about the feelings, and I don't know if this is relevant or not, but I think one of the biggest keys in it, which I think is part of getting out of my head about it, is when a feeling comes up, not judging it. And for me, who was 100% judgmental of any feelings, good or bad, in the past, when, if I have a feeling now, I kind of, I laugh, and I'm like, well, I have a girl, I can, I, I am a girl, I can have a ridiculous feeling, like, you know, something that seems unjustified, realizing that it is what it is and validating it. And I think that's part of what also keeps me out of my head about it is because if I get a feeling, my tendency is to analyze the snot out of it. And that's in my head. So it's kind of like, it's almost negating the feeling at that point and going back into my math brain. Whereas my practice is if I get a feeling, I just sit back and I'm like, cool, I'm having this feeling that, well, that's happening. It is what it is. And sometimes I understand why I'm having it and sometimes I don't. But when I just kind of kick back with the cool, there, there it goes. And mm-hmm. sometimes I even laugh at it. I'm like, wow, this is so pathetic. But I'm not judging it. It's like, you know, well, pathetic is kind of a judgment. But, you know, I'm, I'm laughing at it like, well, this is a really girly moment for me and I'm just going to let it ride and whatever because it keeps me out of my head. And the more I do that, I think it almost trains my subconscious or whatever you want to call it to be okay with it. And therefore my head doesn't feel the need to kick in. 
Totally. Yeah. And when you talk about all of the different voices, I think that's that's something that we all have to learn how to discern. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what this podcast is about, right? Listening to your inner voice. And it's not just about listening to it. It's about knowing the difference between that voice and the voice that tells you you suck and the voice that says you should be able to figure this out and all of those ways that we tend to beat ourselves up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm curious, do you do you use meditation or do you have a a physical practice or journaling? Is there anything that you do to help you stay like rooted down and connected? Well, I'm actually right now I'm trying to get I'm not a schedule person like I I if any like I I don't I don't schedule myself, but I'm really trying to encourage myself to start a morning meditation. And just because I'm, I'm getting to the point now where it feels so good and so grounding. And I could just imagine how amazing my day could be if I could do that in the beginning. I'm not all that smart in the mornings. And so really doing anything other than dragging myself out of bed is, you know, but I, I wanted to make it a more habitual thing, but I love meditation. I started that probably, um, oh gosh, I can't even num- numerous years ago. Um, and sometimes there were meditation groups and I love doing that kind of stuff, but there's, I don't know of any right now. And so even in the spiritual psychology degree, when I worked on that, there was a lot of meditation there. Um, I have other things. I kind of have a whole arsenal of tools. I meditation though, I think one of the coolest things about meditation, and I really think it helps with the feelings and the voices and the, just navigating all the territory we're talking about is the idea of neutral observation. Because, you know, for anyone who's newer to meditation, it can be frustrating sometimes because you think that you're supposed to stop thinking, which then makes you think more and then you think more and then you start judging. Your, but, you know, you think you're whole, doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, totally. I love the, um, I don't remember what app it was on the phone, but it gave this little uh, video where it shows you sitting on a hill and you're literally just watching the cars go back and forth and each yes. car is labeled. Yes, headspace. Yeah. headspace. Headspace. That's it. Yes. I thought uh-huh. that was the coolest illustration of what it's about because it's, it's neutral observation. It's not that you can't have the thoughts or the feelings, but you get to this place where you can sit back and just watch them pass you through. And in the spiritual psychology degree, when I did that, it was an experiential program. And the way that they set it up is you work in trios where there's two people who are actually doing the interaction, but the third seat is the neutral observer. And it teaches you to sit back and just watch what's happening in front of you. And it, in the beginning, it's tough because you hear someone like, Oh, I have the perfect solution for that person. Or, you know, you want to chime in or, Oh, they're doing it wrong or, Oh, but it teaches you're not allowed to. And I think that, more than anything, because I practice that 24 seven. I mean, I remember being in the airport a couple of years ago and our flight got canceled and delayed and it was this big mess. And I sat back and I watched the entire airplane's worth of people just lose their minds. I mean, it was, people are screaming at each other. And it was the first time that I really sat back and I, it was super annoying because it messed my whole schedule up. I was going to Costa Rica, blew out one of my Costa Rica days. And, you know, I had every reason to be mad, but I just sat back and watched the whole thing. And that, that is a constant practice for me. And I think more than anything else that brings me, brings my stress down. It just makes everything okay. And then, you know, again, less to think about. Mm, mm -hmm. So good. So good. So I want to dive into your decision to leave your soulless corporate job (laughs) in the gray cement cubicle um, and start something completely just out of your realm Mm -hmm. even with with your real estate thing. How did you know that that was the thing that you were supposed to do? Well, you know, I think... I remember being young. I was, I've always been very independent. I, me listening to anyone has never really been a thing. Like me having a boss, I assumed was not going to be a thing. So I I kind of, I was fortunate in having some level of knowing before it started, but you know, kind of in lieu of this voice thing, my job, uh, that's how I felt about it. The gray cubicle and soulless and all that kind of stuff. But the reality was I was working as a top secret Uh, flight test engineer for top secret military planes. And like, I was going to top secret locations all the time. I was working. I mean, I really, if you put it on paper, had 
the coolest job on the planet. I right. mean, it sounds most, really cool. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like wow. Like I mean, I've been to places that only books have been written about. I've you know I've gotten to do truly some of the coolest things, which super sucks because I can't really talk about any of them. Which I'm like, oh come on. Mm. Um, but you know, on paper, it looks like the dream job. And for pretty much everybody I worked with, I had the dream job. And I, for a lot of people, I had the dream job. But the thing was, it wasn't my dream job. And I'm, I'm so glad I did it. I got to see the coolest things. I learned so much. I'm so glad I worked a corporate job because now I understand that side of business. And, you know, I got to experience it. I just, you know, the coolest thing that could have happened to me. But for me, it was soulless. And so I think it's an important distinguishment to say distinguishment. I don't even know if that's a word. Um, well, we're going to make it a word. We're going to, it's a word now. <laughs> English was never my stronger suit. Um, but you know, I think it's a good clarification for people to realize, you know, a lot of the world can tell you what the dream job is or what you should be doing and all these things. But if you know that it, if it's soulless for you, even if it's not soulless for the rest of the world, that's important. And so that was kind of the case for me. And I tried, like, um, I eventually got out of the cubicle. I did more field stuff. I was putting big boots on and, you know, I got to take my four wheel drive truck up a mountain and go play with stuff. You know, I got to get out of the office and I tried to make it more me. But once I did the coolest stuff and I still felt like it was pretty soulless, I was like, okay, I can honestly say that I tried everything. And now I know that I have to go. And it was, um, you know, it was it was a little bit of a combo of knowing that I, I had no choice just for my own soul. Um, but also the way that it all developed. Um, I'm a big fan of organic business building. Like when I do business consulting and all that, I really uh, preach towards, um, you know, doing, you know, people say do what you love and the money will come. Yeah, kind of. Some things should probably stay hobbies. But, you know, real estate for me, in a way I love it, but it's not a passion for me, but it's a vehicle for what I love, which is my current lifestyle. And when I started it, it started very small. It started just as me investing and doing something smart with my money. And then it evolved. I was so excited about it. I was telling people about it. And then I was sending all these people to the deals I was doing. And the guys finally came to me and said, listen, you're sending so many people to us anyways. If you'll go get your real estate license, we can legally pay you referral fees. I was like, well, that seems like easy, fun side money. So I started doing that as a secondary thing. And then one morning I kind of woke up. I was like, wait a minute, is this my ticket out of corporate? Like, can this be a career and pay a salary for me? And that's how it developed. But I think there's so much importance in the organic side because at that point it had happened so gracefully and so organic. Well, that part happened gracefully. Me diving into everything was the furthest thing from graceful. But at that point, because of how graceful it had laid itself out, it was so clear to me. There were no questions at all that I had to be doing this. It just, it was almost like someone signed me up for this and I had no choice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that it was a little bit of partially knowing, but partially building it in a way that made it certain. It kind of concreted that knowing for me. And so I just kind of had to that it is, it was what it was. Mm -hmm. What I think is really interesting distinction that I want to point out to people that I heard you say was that real estate is not your passion. Mm -hmm. Living life the way you want to live it is your passion. Yeah. And I think so often we get confused and we think that our work, the thing that creates our financial income has to be what we're passionate about. That right. has to be our purpose. And I think sometimes for some people it is. I mean, yeah. I, I know for me that that is true. However, it doesn't have to be that. And I right. think that like you, you know what your passion is. That's your passion is to live life the way you want to live it, to create a life that makes you happy, that you can do the things that you want. And you found the perfect vehicle that supports that. Yeah. C can you talk a little bit about that just for everyone to really get that in their heads. I think it's important. Yeah, I think it's such a huge point because I will say that, you know, if you're going to go the entrepreneurial route, they don't call it the entrepreneurial roller coaster for no reason. It real and it truly is is I had already kind of started the feelings journey prior to this, but if I really wanted something to really land that feelings thing home, it was becoming an entrepreneur. That first <laughs> that first year Man, I had a lot of feelings. Like, 
happened. You know, I didn't know where my rent was coming from. I didn't know where my food was coming from. And for someone who had always been in control of everything leading up to that, there were a lot of feelings. So not only am I trying to now start a business and I'm trying to feed myself, now I have these things called feelings that I have no idea what to do with. And, you know, so it was kind of, it was kind of an exhausting first year. But um, what you're saying is so true because I think it is impactful. Imperative. I don't think anyone could even succeed as an entrepreneur if you don't have passion somewhere in the equation because the only thing that got me through the ups and downs and the roller coaster was my passion. My passion was for the why. Why I was doing this was because I want this lifestyle. I want freedom. Freedom's always been my word. And I want this so bad that I'm willing to rough out the hard times. And for some people, like what you're saying is, for some people, the passion might be the why. Like, why are you doing this? Um, maybe it's to support your family or maybe it's whatever. But for other people, you might, your passion might be the thing that you're doing. So like, if you, Kelly, love doing podcasts, you can actually, you know, you can make a bit, I don't know how podcasting works, but you can make a business out of it. That's the thing that you're passionate about. Like, I think passion has to be somewhere in the equation just from a survival standpoint, but it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have to be the thing that you're doing. So it could be the thing that you're doing or why are you doing it? And I think those two are the biggest, you know, cause they say do what you love and the money will follow. Well, you know, if you're making like, I don't know, like if you love bicycle riding, cool, but you know, or is that a career or should that stay a hobby? You know, it's kind of the distinguishing thing. And in my case, I know for a fact, I didn't necessarily know what I loved. When I started digging into how I was going to get out of corporate, I figured it either had to be real estate, something or another, or starting a business. I didn't know what that thing was going to be. I didn't really have some uh, marketable skill or service that I could offer people. And I didn't even know what it was that I loved. And so that was part of the journey for me is coming to find that out. And it, I found out that I loved the idea of lifestyle design, you know, Tim Ferriss's four hour work week. I'm like, I love that. Now, what's it gonna take to get that? And, you know, then the pieces kind of start tying themselves in together. So yeah, figuring out where your passion is and just being clear on that is huge. And in real estate, I like real estate. I love going and shopping for investment properties. Like my main job is just talking to people. I'm a matchmaker and it turns out, and now my engineering disaster makes sense. I used to annoy all of my coworkers because engineers, God bless them, uh, are typically very introverted. They're very, <laughs> I can say I'm married this to say, one. Yeah. I'm married oh, to one. I'm so I can, so sorry. I can, oh no, no, we're, we're a good match. <laughs> well, yeah. Cause if you're on the feelings end of the spectrum, he's probably on exactly. the thinking end and it works out perfect. Exactly. Um, but you know, I used to annoy everyone at my job because I just wanted to talk to people. And it was funny because I didn't know that's what was happening because when I grew up, I was so shy. Like I was the kid that if a stranger said hi to me, I buried my face in my mom's leg. Like I didn't talk to people. I was shy. And here I'm in this engineering job. I was so bored at my desk. I just, I'd pop to everyone's cubicle. I'm like, Hey, what you doing? Want to go to lunch? What are you doing now? What'd you do this weekend? And I, I didn't even know who that was. And then if I wasn't doing that, I was sending them instant messages. Hey, what are you doing? What, what you doing now? What, and everyone's like, we're working. <laughs> and so I didn't know that about myself. And now that that's what I do. But, you know, the journey is about figuring those things out. And so, yeah, I passion really, it's such a important and interesting topic. I mean, a, a whole conversation could be just about the passion of it. Like, why are you doing this? Or what, what is it you're trying to get at? Or do you just love the thing that you're doing and figuring mm -hmm. that out as a starting point? It just, it, I think it just opens up so many possibilities. Totally. So one of the things you said earlier in our conversation was you went on a soulful journey to learn who you actually are. Mm -hmm. And that that's still happening. But yeah. as of today, who is Ali Boone? Well, the good news is it turns out I actually am a girl. So that's been super exciting. <laughs> that was <laughs> fairly revelatory. Um, but I am, you know, I think... One of my big things these days is being of service. Like I was so busy doing all my math equations before I understand, I understood service, but really 
who I feel like I am now is somebody who helps other people. And, you know, I bring a lot of strengths to the table and I have a life now that people, you know, it's, um, it's a positive influence. And, you know, like I said, I'm in prisons all the time now. And truly, I don't know that anything has brought me more joy than working with the inmates in the way that we do. It just, it's an experience I can't even explain. And, but it goes, and same with my job in real estate, that one's not quite as, uh, you know, amazing, but it's still talking to people and it's helping other people. And it's, yeah, it's just, it's kind of a, kind of a life of service. Um, you know, I'm very much in surrender mode. I don't know if you've ever read the book, the surrender experiment. It's like my new Bible. I've read through it twice. Mm. And I, love I really the word surrender. It's oh, one of my favorites. Yeah. And it's really getting that it's the famous idea of getting out of our own way. And so, yeah, it's, I, I would say the, the newer me, um, the more grounded and centered me is much more service-based. I really, Math these days, like I actually had a friend's daughter who was studying for the GRE right now for grad school and she was totally hitched up on the math. I was like, oh my God, give me the math problem. I want the math problem. <laughs> like sometimes it's fun to kind of go back and be the math nerd for a second. But for the most part, I, it's it, that stuff doesn't matter to me anymore. Like it's really more about what matters and people matter. And I just, you know, I, we said something earlier about, you know, people believing in themselves regardless of what they've done and people's worth and that I just you know the spiritual psychology degree I admit I only started it because I just thought it would be hilarious to tell people I had master's degrees in aerospace engineering and spiritual psychology like that was literally why I started it and but it turns out like that's that's my jam that's the only college graduation I've ever gone to because it meant so much versus you know, even my rocket science degree, it was like, meh, whatever. Um, yeah, but it, it's all about amazing. meaning. It's really, it's meaning and what we're all here for. And everyone, I mean, not to sound totally cliche, but everyone just learning to love each other and realize none of us showed up with owner's manuals. Like, oh, truly. That's, that's I tell so that to the prisoners true. all the time. I'm like, listen, you know, given the circumstances you were given and the beliefs that you were taught, like, I, who's to say that anybody wouldn't have done what you did in that moment? We did not show up with owner's manuals. And that, to me, is my biggest message to everyone because it just, you know, we all put this pressure on ourselves to be something or be someone or meet someone else's standards, and it's it's not it. So I mm -hmm. really am loving exploring that world and working with people more and more on it. Yeah, I love that. And I would say, too, we're not given owner's manuals, but we are given our intuition and our yeah. inner voice that can really help us through these hard places of mm -hmm. not knowing. And yeah. so to that, my question that I ask all of my guests is in your life right now, what is your inner voice saying to you? Me and my inner voice are, I'm not going to say we're at an impasse right now. I'm still listening to it, but I'm slightly annoyed at the message. The message is that, <laughs> you know, let's clarify. That's allowed. You, don't, you don't always no. have to like your inner voice. It's true. <laughs> Um, my inner voice is really almost on repeat telling me that slow and steady wins the race. And, you know, the earlier half of my life, I moved fast. I really, I went from flight instructing to engineering to, you know, I was, I, I had very little downtime. I just, I was constantly doing things. And now I've now been in business for, we just had our sixth birthday. And for the first couple of, for the first few years, I was doing this other master's degree. I was doing, you know, I was trying to make, do some marketing efforts. I was trying to do a lot of things. And now this year is the first year that I've really been able to just chill out, relax, go slow, and really get back to building the foundation and putting, you know, laying it brick by brick. And that's what I'm doing right now. And it can be so frustrating sometimes because I want to get somewhere. I want to accomplish certain things. I want certain things to happen. But every day my inner voice keeps saying, slow and steady wins the race. And I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> but it's true. It's just, you know, being patient with the process and realizing for me, at least my experience of it is realizing that things don't happen faster than they're happening because there's other things to learn that once the bigger thing happens, it'll be a lot more sturdy. And so that's what I, me and my voice talk about all the time is just, there's a reason it's happening at the pace that it's happening. Slow and steady wins the race every time. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, I really appreciate you saying you don't always want to listen to it because <laughs> I think that's a really important point that we sometimes miss. Yeah. That, you know, the, the thing that 
from our soul, like that our soul is asking us to do is not always going to be the easy thing. Mm -hmm. It's not always going to be the fun thing. It's not always going to be the glamorous thing. Yeah. But that doesn't mean it's not the right thing. And, you know, I love something you said earlier about how when I said we don't come with owner's manuals and you said, but we do have our intuition. And right then I was like, oh, my God, like that is essentially kind of an owner's manual. Like that's really kind of what the surrender experiment's talking about. And just like you just said, it's what he clarifies in the book that's been really helpful for me is that it's not, it's not about my likes and dislikes. It's about what's presented in front of me. And I may not be super excited about that. Like it, you know, and it may not be something I want to hear, may not whatever, but when I follow it, it, it tends to lay itself out pretty phenomenally. Like it's, you know, it's listening to that voice. And can I tell you a really quick story about my favorite voice story? Yes. So when I was starting my company, I had to pick a name for it. And I, to this day, think the name of my company, I still am self-conscious about it. I think it's fairly ridiculous. It's Hipster Investments, for anyone who doesn't know. Um, I think it's a fairly, not even fairly, I think it's a completely ridiculous name for a company. First of all, I'm not even a hipster. Second, hipsters have such a negative reputation in a lot of ways. It just sounds stupid. So there's my judgy statement about it. But in the beginning, when I was going to pick a name, this hipster investment thing kept coming in my head. And I was like, would you get out of my head? Like that is the most, that's no, that's so stupid, but not even a chance. So I would ponder all these more professional sounding names and whatever. And yada, yada, yada. this hipster nonsense would not get out of my head. And I ran it by a couple of people who were like, oh dear God, please don't name your company hipster <laughs> investment. Like, why would you do that? And I was like, I don't know, but it won't get out of my head. And I went with it and I, I was not pumped about it. To this day, six years later, I'm still not pumped about it. I'm like, oh God, like how stupid do people think I am? And, but it has been the best thing that could have ever happened to my business because number one, it sounds so off the wall in the real estate world that people have to click on it. So it automatically brings me a million leads, but you know, once they, I knew if they went there and the website was horrible or whatever, then I'd be really kind of shooting myself in the foot. But it gets me so many leads. And then what also ended up happening is the reality is as a business owner, I can't work with everyone anyways. It's just not practical. And the name has become such an amazing client filter for me. Like there's a whole slew of people online that think the name's horrible. And when I listen to them talk, I'm like, God, I would not want to work with that person like they sound terrible to work with and but then on the flip side I get so many people that think it's the coolest name on the planet and they are so fun to work with so it's become this client filter so and it's funny that I'm still self-conscious about the name but that was purely a voice thing and I followed it despite how (laughs) trepidatious I was to put it nicely and it has been the best thing that could have ever happened to my business the business has become very successful and you know, it's got this god awful name. <laughs> well, but it was a voice thing. I don't think it's an awful name. In fact, when I started doing my research before we got on the call today, I thought it just sounds fun. Yeah, and it, know? It, that's exactly what we want to portray: is happiness and fun. And yeah. we're in real estate investing. It's such an intimidating, stuffy industry. Like just ugh. Like that was that was what we want to do: is bring a little light to it. So I'm thanks for the feedback. I like that. Yeah, no, <laughs> and I'm not a hipster either. Um, so and I, I still think, oh, that's that seems fun. Um, <laughs> Ali, speaking of fun, this has been really fun today. Thank you so mm-hmm. much for being here. Why don't you let my listeners know where they can connect with you online if they want to learn more about your company or follow you on social media or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, so social media, funny story. I have never once had a Facebook page. Uh, Oh, my my goodness. I know. My company. So more and more podcasts I do and I get interviewed, people try and stalk me online. They don't see a Facebook page. So I've actually gotten feedback saying, you know, I actually thought you didn't exist. I'm like, is that where we are in the world today? (laughs) Like, I don't have Facebook, so I don't exist. Um, but my company has Facebook. It's just under Hipster Investments. But you can always email me directly. Like I said, I love talking to people. I love meeting other people. I love being of service. Uh, my email address is just Ali, A-L-I, at hipsterinvestments.com. Um, I welcome anybody. Definitely tell me you found me on this podcast. And then I will say my one social media vice is Instagram. I love looking at pictures. And I don't have that many Instagram followers. So I have a little... Uh, um, lack of 
confidence in that. So if you want to follow me on Instagram, it's alliboon.com and the dot is spelled out. So D-O-T. So it's A-L-I-B-O-O-N-E-D-O-T-C-O-M. And that's also my Twitter, uh, which I'm not really on that much. But um, yeah, reach out. I do the real estate thing. It's all uh, fairly hands-off passive investing. I'm not a fan of swinging hammers or working. So those are the kind of deals I work with. And I, uh, I mentioned earlier, I've been doing business consulting. That's a newer thing this year. That website's just alleyboon.com, like the actual dot. Um, so you can find me in any of those places except Facebook and, but email me directly with, you know, any, even if you're just saying hi, like I said, I love meeting new people and good people know good people. And yeah. Fantastic. Well, you have a new follower. I just followed you on Instagram. Fun. Yeah. So oh, we'll I'm be looking. Instagram friends on top of being real friends. Oh, I love it. Yeah. So Allie, thank you so much for being here today. I hope that um, all of you guys, I know that you, you loved, love, love this information. And, and I can't wait to share it with my listeners. Yeah. Well, I enjoyed it so much. I do so many podcasts that are all real estate or business. And this one was such a fun twist and I think this these kinds of topics are really what life's about now I don't think it's about you know getting the best job and doing you know where are you putting your money like I love talking about what to me is the more meaningful stuff so I'm so appreciative that you went that route and I really really enjoyed it oh well thank you I appreciate that thank you again for listening you guys if you love listening to in her voice I can't even tell you how much it would mean to me for you to take a quick screenshot and share it on Instagram, share it on Facebook. Be sure to tag me and let me know what you think of this week's episode and share it with your friends and family because that, that is how we create a difference. That is how I am creating impact in this world, like Ali talked about. And when you share that, you are also creating impact. And I am so grateful to you for doing that. Listen, it's coming up into the holiday season, and I just want to wish all of you happy, happy holidays. I hope that you are with your family and that you're just in gratitude for the year that has been. And um, I wish you well. Always remember, we need you showing up to do the work that you were born to do in this world. We need you creating impact, even if impact for you means impact in your family, it doesn't have to be impacting thousands. Impact is impact, especially when done with an intention. And I want you to know that you were born for this. You are worthy. 